you're watching West Hartford uh, Community uh, Television. Watching, uh, watching uh, West Hartford uh, Community uh, Television. You're watching West Hartford Community uh, Television for the community by the community. Watching West Hartford Community Television. West Hartford Community Television. West Hartford Community Television. For the community by the community. Hi, and thank you for joining us on another episode of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And tonight, Bob, we're discussing blending grapes. Jim, I know. I'm excited. <laughs> now, these are grape varietals that normally you see in a bottle uh, in very minute quantities. They're usually blended in with Cabernet Sauvignon or Merlot, and they don't really perform well on their own. They're usually too harsh, too high in tannins, too acidic. Uh, so it's very rare that you see them individually, 100% uh, of, of just that varietal in the bottle by itself. So I'm really excited about showing these off tonight. Yeah, and I got to say, when you pre-pour this first pour before the cameras got on, that, the aroma of the first one we're going to be tasting is really quite spectacular. These are big, powerful wines, and that's, you know, that's part of the reason I wanted to do this show, is just to share these with you. And even though it's summertime, you know, right in the heat of summer, I think you're going to be seeing this show in August, right? Or mm -hmm. July. July. Um, I think these wines, you, as you told me, can be drunk all, all season, right? These, a lot of these go really well with, uh, because they've got a smoky characteristic to them, they go really well with barbecued foods or sausage uh, or some really hard aged cheese. Sausage so is big this year. Yeah. You, know, I, I, you see all kinds of sausages quality wise in the grocery stores and uh, specialty stores. People are really cooking up a lot of sausage this year. And I, for what I see here, I think this might be perfect. These are gonna be so, great pairs. Hot or spicy yes. or mild. Yeah, yeah it'll, it'll work with all that. So the, the whole reason I'm, I wanted to do this show is I did a wine tasting a couple of months ago with the winemaker. Um, this, Michael David Vineyards is owned by two brothers, Michael and David Phillips. And this is a family vineyard. Uh, it actually got started back in the 1860s, uh, right after the Civil War. Wow. So it's been around for generations and generations. Uh, the two brothers renamed it to the Michael David Vineyards uh, a couple of years ago. And they're famous for Seven Deadly Zens. So if you've seen that on the store shelves, that's their wine. That's and we've the had it on the show, I believe. Yeah, we have. It's a fantastic Zinfandel blend. It's uh, uh, Zinfandel from seven different vineyards in the Lodi area. Fabulous wine. Well, they've, they've struck gold again uh, with this Inkblot series and the Carignan that we're going to drink tonight. And Carignan is probably a name a lot of our viewers might not be familiar with. No. These are, these are very obscure grape varietals to the United States drinker. Uh, and, and part of the reason for that is because they're used in such small quantities as a blending grape rather than being in a bottle all by themselves. The question is, is American palate ready to uh, gravitate towards this? Uh, I hope so, because yeah. these are fabulous. So let's start off with the Carignan. Uh, this is a blending grape that started off in probably the southwest region of France. and. It got kind of overproduced in the 70s. The French government was handing out subsidies to winemakers to pump up volume for this. And, and this particular varietal creates uh, twice as much berries as a normal grape varietal will anyway. So the volume just shot through the roof. Was this what ha similar to what happened with Beaujolais? Uh, well, we talk, we've talked about a couple of different varietals that got overproduced. Uh, Lambrusco was the, the one we had on the yeah, show okay. yeah. where yeah, the Italians just way overproduced Lambrusco and the quality dropped. And the same thing happened to Carignan, uh, although it was more of a blending grape than anything else. Uh, but the guys over at Michael David Vineyards are geniuses and they figured out how to grow it in Lodi and they found out how to, to make it really taste great just by itself. Well, I got to say, I know it's television, but the aroma from this is so powerful yet smooth before I even take a sip. Yeah. It's, it's like a velvety aroma to it almost. It really is. It, and it, it jumps out of the glass at you, you know, from a couple of feet away. And then look, look, at, that, look at that happy face. That's Sweet a, bippity, that's good. <laughs> And it's good in a way, like I said, in the summertime. I know Jim and I have talked numerous times about the kind of wine we like to drink all year. And sometimes I, I, I stay away from heavy reds. Mm -hmm. But wow, would this pair well with what we we're talking about. And I, you know what? As, as dark as this is, uh, it's still not even considered a heavy red. Mm -hmm. Wine Folly put together a chart they call a boldness chart. And they, they went from Pinot Noir all the way up to Tanat, which is the last grape varietal we're going to try tonight. And the Carignan actually ranks right about in the middle. It's a kind of a medium bold on their on their chart 
So, and it, when you taste it, I mean, it tastes kind of heavy. It tastes a little full in the mouth, um, but it's not anywhere near as heavy as the Tanat that we're going to get to later. That is really spectacular. And um, a wine like this, is this something that can be stored for a good period of time? Does it actually get yeah. better as it's sitting? It's actually, they say you shouldn't even be drinking it till three years after the harvest date. So this is a 2014. So we're, we're right at the point where you should be opening this bottle, but it could use five years. So this is the kind of thing if you're going to buy this. And I don't think you can get this locally, I believe, correct? I don't think so either. I, you know, the tasting I did was in North Andover, Massachusetts at a wine store called Wine Connection. Uh, it was a special event. You know, they've got a really unique relationship with the winemaker. So uh, David flew out for the weekend, uh, did a tasting. Uh, very select few people uh, got invited to this. And then I got to pour next to him for three hours. So it was really an honor to get to talk to him this whole time. Uh, but that, I, to my knowledge, is the only store that carries these wines in Massachusetts. Now, you can, you can order these online. If you go to the Michael David website, uh, these are available online. Uh, the Carignan's $25, and the Inkblot series are $35 a piece. Okay, that's a little higher than we so normally do, but it's it, well worth yeah, it. Yeah, they're, they're a little pricier than you and I like to pay for a wine, uh, but again, I think it's worth it. And i got to say for our viewers who also like having wine with their red wine, I just had a piece of the Cabot uh, Sharp mm -hmm. cheese. Wow, it, it, it really, even though there was the, the wine's gone, there was enough wine in my mouth to really highlight the flavor even better. So I should have had a piece of that cheese before I even took it. Well, I, you know what? I haven't had the cheese yet either, but I'm getting, I'm getting kind of a blueberry finish with this. It's, it's, and it's lingering. It's really acidic. It is acidic, but it really is the kind of red, um, I know that for myself personally, it, there's enough character, there's enough going on in the red to make you say, wow, this is really interesting. But at the same time, it's not so overwhelming. And it doesn't, there's no burning sensation, because this is a 13.5 no. alcohol red wine. Yeah. And a lot of times when you're at that level, you will get a little burn, and some people don't like that little burn. Um, but there's no burn on this one at all. No, and you're right, with that high alcohol level, I would expect a little bit of a burn too, but. Not there. Of course, it could just mean we've been drinking so much we, we don't feel the burn <laughs> anymore. So it could be that too, but it's really a smooth red wine. I, again, and this goes back to the genius that Michael and David are. I mean, they just, they figure out how to make something that's normally really acidic, really tannic, really bitter, turn into a, a very drinkable table wine. It's, it's, and you could have glass after glass of this. I mean, it's not something you want to just try a little and then you've had enough and you, you want to move on to something else. I, I could sit down and drink the whole bottle and enjoy myself. Yeah, this is, this is definitely the kind of red that's a conversation red. Um, you're not going to just be pounding it down while you're eating. You're going to be drinking it slowly with a good quality meat or red meat. But at the same time, this will stand up to just a nice socializing with some cheese mm -hmm. and crackers and, you know, talking about the day's events. So uh, yeah. that's a winner. That's a winner, yeah. Jim. And this, uh, you know, I know it's July, but uh, this makes a great Thanksgiving wine, too. So if, if you're starting to write down wines that you want to serve for Thanksgiving, and I, I'm kind of a wine geek, so I but do thanks, this. Thanksgiving's tough. It is. A lot of people think you can't even drink red wine with turkey. Uh, and, you know, we did a show on Thanksgiving years and years ago, uh, and there are a couple of reds you can drink on the Thanksgiving table. And, you know, Pinot Noir is one yeah, of them. Red Zinfandel is one of them. Uh, but the Carignan is another varietal that you could have at Thanksgiving. I would need no excuse to have that on my table any time of yeah. the year, Jim. So I'm giving you a high thumbs up on that. So, all right. And this is actually one of the, I think this is the second or third time where you've actually picked out all the wines on the show tonight. Uh, I have nothing to compare myself with. And I, you know what? I, yeah, this is kind of, I'm sorry I stole the show from you. That, but. That's okay. I mean, <laughs> usually my wines are okay. Sometimes I'm the one that has the clunker, but uh, I don't think you're going to have a clunker, but if this is the way no, you're starting no, off. No, these are all fabulous. I've had all of them, uh, and I, you know, I discussed all of them with the winemaker, and I just, I fell in love with the whole series. And I, I loved his concept. Uh, you know, David talked about the fact that Lodi right now is so experimental. The winemakers there are trying all kinds of varietals that normally wouldn't grow in the area. Uh, they're trying, you know, Italian grapes. They're trying obscure French stuff, and and they're just and they're doing stuff like this where they, you know, they're not blending yeah. it. I mean, this is this is a grape that everyone had always assumed was good for you know five percent of the bottle, if that, and then you had to use the rest, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. Well, once again, fantastic. And you know, I'm looking at the next bottle we're going to be tasting, which is the Cabernet Franc, which I know a lot of people in Connecticut know that we make our own Cabernet Franc here in Connecticut, I believe, mm -hmm. don't we? Yeah. And, uh, you know, th there's pros and cons to Connecticut Cab Franc because most of the grapes, I think, are imported. But this, this is a Cabernet Franc, and, but this is a California Cabernet Franc. Yeah, this is also from Lodi. Everything we're drinking tonight is from Lodi. Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and pour it for you. Uh, Cab Franc is actually the parent of Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is a cross between Cab Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. 
And again, Cabernet Franc is it's a uh, grape that doesn't always taste good by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, usually winemakers are blending it in to add some structure to the wine, to add a little color, to add some acidity, uh, and to add some tannins. And that's what you get from all these varieties. Yeah, Cab Franc is a lot of tannins in a Cab yeah. Franc. And uh, <clears throat> this, this aroma, which I smelled once again when you started pouring, not quite as powerful as the, uh, the first one, but uh, there's definitely, you're, you're smelling this wine before it even hits your nose. Yeah, these, these all are really big, bold, powerful wines. Uh, and if we go back to Wine Folly's wine boldness chart that I talked about earlier, this is still in the medium range. This is not a heavy hitter. You know, it's been a while actually since I had a Cab Franc, and uh, I'm noticing something that is both a pro and a con, at least for my, ta my taste buds. It's, it's an even tasting grape. The first one, I got a burst here, a burst there, a burst here. The Cab Franc, though, it's sort of a one note. It's spreading, but it's the same note as it goes across it's, my tongue. It's, it's a velvetier taste. It's a smoother taste. Um, I do get some mocha at the finish. It's, it's a very late blooming mocha taste that comes out right at the end. Uh, but your point is accurate. I mean, it's, it's consistent all the way up until that finish. Yeah, and I'm not even getting any big powerful aftertaste. It no. sort of tastes the same no, going in. The mocha is subtle and it fades away. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's different, but it's good. And uh, it just reminds me of my experience with Cab Franks. This seems to sort of highlight and reinforce what I'm familiar with, that I, don't want, I hate to say one note because that's, I don't want to diminish it, mm -hmm. because it's just the note that it has is good. Yeah. And it stays there. Yeah. So I, you get a couple different flavors. I'm sort of getting a, I do get the mocha that you're talking about slightly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but to me, it's more of a, a mild dark cherry type right. flavor. Right. And it's, you know what, honestly, after the, the Carignan, uh, you know, that's a hard act to follow. So it's... Well, that's true. I mean, that's why we do the show, because you know, we're following <laughs> one act after another. I, I wanted to drink these in, in the boldness ranking order. So when you look at Wine Folly's chart, you know, the, you start with the Carignan and you work all the way down to the Tanat. You know, I wanted to ask so. you, because we didn't have a chance to talk about this when you came down today. I love the labels on these. Is, mm. is there a history of why they chose these particular type of uh, labels? You know, I did not discuss that with David, but this, this whole Inkblot series is his homage to blending grapes. Just and black and white. I like yeah, that. Yeah, so. it's kind of a Rorschach test. Yep. And, and I don't know why the Carignan isn't in the Inkblot series also. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a single varietal blending grape, uh, so I, I don't know why he didn't work that into the Inkblot series. But, uh, but all these are fabulous. So. And once again, we're looking at the same price point. Yeah, everything, uh, the Carignan's $25 and everything else is 35 And most of the stuff you'd have to order online, unless you uh, Here in Connecticut, I think you're going to have to order online. I don't think you're going to find these in the stores here. Uh, it's, these are small productions. Um, I, I don't think he has a distributor here in Connecticut. Um, you can check, though, and I always say this, you know, every time we do a show, I talk about wines, and if they're not available here in Connecticut or if they're hard to find, I always yep. say, you know, go to your local merchant and just have them look it up. Uh, they, they've got a book they can look through and see if this is available here in Connecticut. If they can get it, what I've noticed is uh, retail pricing is a little lower than what Michael and David charge online, uh, and they do that to protect the retailer. Sure. Yep. So it's, you know, these are going to be in the 25 to $30 range, roughly. But it's, this is the kind of wine, uh, which is why I sort of like the wine clubs myself, but this is the kind of wine where... We can talk about it on the show, which is what we're doing tonight, but I think you really have to taste these yourself mm -hmm. to realize how unique, different, and good at least the first two wines are. And, and the other thing is, once you have these by themselves, you'll start to pick up what they're contributing to blends that you start to drink. That's true. So when you have a Cabernet Sauvignon or a Merlot that's got a significant amount of Cab Franc blended in with it, you'll say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm picking up some of the, you know, the tighter tannins or the acidity that you're going to get from that grape varietal. Yeah, that's. Uh, I didn't check the legs on both these. I think this leg, the legs on this one's probably a little bit heavier than the first one. Yeah, they're, about they're, the same. they're quite persistent. Yeah, this is that's it's a great pair of legs on that. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> All right, on to the Petit Verdot. And is that how you pronounce it, Petit Verdot? Mm -hmm. That's exactly the way you pronounce it. Yes. I like sometimes highlight in the front, say like, Petit Verdot. You know, it just sort of sounds a little bit more. You know, it, and it, again, this comes from France. And the berries on the Petit Verdot are very, very small, which is why it gets that Petit name. And this is a dark wine. This is, when you look at the darkness, the boldness scale, uh, this is into the dark territory. This is actually number six. So they had, I think they had 30 different varietals on that scale. And so we're, we're almost to the very end when we get to the Petit Verdot. And what I think is interesting, before I even taste this, is I know we're moving up the boldness scale, but 
I don't really smell that one, which means all the yeah. flavor is locked up in there until I take probably the first sip. Yeah, I really have to jam my nose all the way into the glass to get anything off of this one. And maybe it just needs to breathe a little more. Yeah. And there it is. It's a, it's, a, it's a big wine. So I think it's sort of, it's such a succulent wine, it's saying to itself, I'm keeping my aromas in the glass until you taste it. It's, it there's nothing that's coming out at the nose right now. Mm -hmm. It's all in, yeah. that, in that fluid right there. Yeah. But I get some spice with this. And oh, there's the, baking spice. And there's spice. Uh, I would even say, I, this might surprise you, a little bit of bacon. All right. Yeah, a, a tad bit of bacon. Because there's a little salty aspect mm -hmm. of this, too. I get the saltiness, yeah. Yeah, good, good call with that. Now, because this wine is so dark, is it the actual grape varietal, or is it because these grapes are being fermented longer? No, this is the varietal, and this is why winemakers choose these grapes. This is one of the reasons why winemakers choose these grapes as blending grapes, is because they want to add color to the wine. So when we get to the Tanat, for example, that's, that's the number one on the boldness scale, uh, but it's also the darkest grape varietal in the world. And so winemakers will blend Tanat into something just to give it color. I, think, you know, I didn't check the alcohol content on these, the ones after this. I, I'm assuming they're all going to be in the 13% range because of their, their heaviness. But yeah. not one of the three wines we tasted do I get any burn at all. No. No, and they, yeah, these are these wines have been very, very. Uh, Michael David has been very uh, careful about crafting these. And, you know, they didn't just harvest the grapes and put it into the bottle. They had to work with this to make it a, a palatable wine, and they've done a phenomenal job. And you, the tasting you went to was how long ago when you tasted? Uh, it was about three months ago, and it was um, it's a, an event that they host annually. Um, the, the owner of the wine store has a personal connection with David. Uh, from the vineyard, and they fly him out every year to do a tasting of his wines. So they, and he also does uh, the Freak Show series. So if you're familiar with uh, with those, those are, are here in Connecticut. I've seen them on the shelves. Um, it's there's a Freak Show Pinot Noir, and there's a Syrah blend, and a couple of others. So it's a whole series of wines. It has nothing to do with the TV show Freak Show, which I thought it was when he told no, me that. No, it's, it's all it's a circus theme. Uh, you know, the labels are all kind of circus themed. Have you tasted and, those? Yes, I've had those. Those are good, also. And are those a little higher or lower price point? Those are a little lower price point. Those are 15 to $20 usually. And uh, he, I, the production, you know, they've got uh, more bottles being produced, so they've got better distribution for those. Well, once again, I, I, I'm taking my third sip of the Petit Vaudot, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm just liking it more and more. This finish is a little dry. You it know, my, does. My mouth's starting to dry out just a little, but it's it's not over an overwhelming sensation. Which I personally like. I like when a red wine finish is dry because that makes you want to eat something, mm -hmm. whether it's a cracker, whether it's a piece of cheese, whether it's a nice foie gras or something yeah. like that. It begs for you to eat something after yeah, you have a it sip. it does. And that's just a function of tannins. You know, tannins kind of dry your mouth out. And so the, the more tanning that's in the wine, the drier your mouth is going to be. But you're right, this is the first one that that, that effect is really so prominent. Yeah, the other two are kind of juicy. It, it, that's probably the best way to describe the finish for those. Yeah, juicy, good, but dries your mouth out. Mm -hmm. So, no yeah. dogs here, Jim, no dogs. I, you know, I hate bringing dogs onto the show, Bob. <laughs> yeah, well, I've still <laughs> never, yeah I, yeah, I know, that, that I still haven't lived down the, the Russian sparkling. <laughs> that's, uh, I don't think I'll ever live that one down, but. Uh. All right, we're on to the tannin. Now this is a varietal, again, that originated in France, uh, but it's now grown predominantly in Uruguay. That's, it's kind of become their national grape. Uh, and as I said earlier, this is the darkest grape varietal sure in the is. world. Uh, you will not find a darker grape on the vine. Wow. And when a winemaker wants to add a lot of color to a red wine, this is a good go-to. And I will say, and once again, there's going to be variables because a lot of times people let these decant or open up for a bit. There is no aroma that I'm smelling on this one. No, again, just, just like with the Petit Verdot, I've got to jam my nose all the way down in the glass to pick up anything. Wow. Another winner? Four is a charm. <laughs> and this is the first one on the table that starts off slow and then pow, right away. You take that first sip and, oh, this is interesting. This yeah. is not much, and then wow, it and just it opens jumps. right up. There's a huge jump, yeah. The acidity floods in. Um, and then the, the tannins kick in. You know, it, it, 
we talk about this all the time, and I know a lot of people who watch the show, uh, whether you're an expert or just a novice, it's really the only way to explain it is what we're saying is, you take a sip, it starts, it, it's just, it's soft, and then all of a sudden it's, it's a really powerful explosion of flavor mm -hmm. in your mouth. And uh, it, it's really amazing. That's why we love wine so much, I guess, because of everything that goes on with the flavor profiles. But that is really a unique flavor right there. It is, and it's a unique experience too, because usually when you drink a wine, you get a lot of acidity or you get a lot of tannins. Uh, it's rare you get both. Yeah. And, and and they're fighting with you, with each other because you know the acidity makes your mouth water and the tannins kind of dry your mouth out and to have both of those characteristics fighting with each other and, and my tongue's getting dry and then it's getting wet and it's it's uh, what a fabulous fabulous experience to, to get this quality tonight at this price point is really very uh, surprising to me i know we've had wines in this price point even a little on the higher side but there is a different level that i think these wines um, that we're drinking tonight that we've had mm -hmm. quite some time on the show um, because of their uniqueness, um, I'm really enjoying these quite a bit. They've done a great job. And, you know, this just goes back to Lodi being so experimental right now. Uh, I don't think you could have done this anywhere else. I don't think winemakers would have been that daring. Uh, and I don't think they would have been able to grow all these varietals successfully either. And there is a, I think we talked about this before, is there a French history to a lot of these grapes? Or uh, are these all French grapes? Yeah, these are all, uh, these are all French uh, and they, they've migrated to other parts of the world. You know, we talked about the six noble grapes uh, the last episode and how, you know, those did really well in France and they were hardy grapes, so they've, they, with the exception of Pinot Noir and to a lesser extent Riesling, and so they were able to spread all over the world and do well all over the world. Uh, these varietals, I think, are a little more finicky, but you still find them grown in France, in South America, in North America. Uh, predominantly California, but yeah. uh, but you well the Cab Franc you see here in Connecticut. So, that's right. Yeah, you know that's that's a, a grape that does well in a lot of locations. It too. is, and I know, uh, like I said, uh, it's my really only experience with Connecticut Reds is the Cab Franc, mm -hmm. and uh, but I, I know California is, is a fascinating place. You know, I I I'm always amazed at what they're able to produce for Reds wine in general. Um, but wow, these have really been quite spectacular tonight. Yeah. So. And, and we have the Phillips family to thank for this. You know, uh, you think about Prohibition wiping out so many winemakers in California. You know, that, their, their business was making wine and growing grapes for wine. And when suddenly you, you couldn't produce alcohol anymore, a lot of them just closed up shop. Yeah. Uh, some of them stayed in business selling wines to churches uh, or just producing wines uh, for consumption. Now you, you can't consume wine varietal grapes uh, it's, it's not like drinking, you know, it's, it's not like it goes into Welch, Welch's grape yeah. juice. They, they don't eat well. Uh, they're very bitter, very harsh. But uh, what the Phillips family did, they were, <laughs> and this is, this is a great way to work around the federal law. You know, they kept growing 15 varietals that were normally made, or normally used for making wine, and they would ship them all over the country with the explicit instructions not to be, this, this grape is not to be used for, for the making of wine. So they knew full well people were buying the stuff, taking it into their homes, and making wine at home. But because they weren't actually producing wines themselves, they got around federal law. Well, we're glad those days are over. Yes. <laughs> and we're glad they stayed in business. And you know, 100 years later, they're making these fabulous wines that we're enjoying tonight. So you may or may not know this. How many other wine varietals does uh, Michael David uh, Produce or besides what we're looking at. Right here. Uh, well, he does the Seven Deadly Zens, which is uh, right. that's all Zinfandel. He does uh, Petite Syrah. He does a Syrah. He does. Um, uh, I, he's got a couple other varietals. I, I can't remember all of them. But and they're all basically in the same price category. Uh, no, they're all over the place. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah he's so he has some he's, stuff. He's got that low end stuff. He's got high end up. stuff. Yeah, he's. You know, like he told me, you know, Lodi is very experimental, and, and he just fits right into that mold. He's he loves playing with different varietals, uh, different blends, different styles. Uh, he's he's willing to experiment. Well, I think I want to go back to the first one after going up that range, like go we back did. to Carignan and see if it still tastes as good. Because you know, like most people, you know, who watch our show or just in general, you know, you're not just drinking one white, one red wine all night. You're drinking a few different varietals, and sometimes I think. Uh, that can be a little vexing on the palate because if you're mixing the different varietals, certain times in the evening, you just forget what you're tasting. You get palate fatigue. You Absolutely. Do. I mean, I have some friends who just stick to one varietal of red or one varietal of mm -hmm. white. I think uh, we always like to mix it up a little bit. I, and that's what I love about having dinner with you is, is we just change it up all night long. And uh, the thing is that's both good and bad because there comes a certain point in the evening where your palate is fatigued. Yeah. I mean, I know you're in the industry and, uh, you know, obviously you taste a lot. 
and obviously you spit a lot, but mm -hmm. there still comes a point where, my God, I can't taste right. anything. Yeah, even if you're spitting, you, your palate gets to a point where it's just had too much wine in the mouth and, and you can't really taste anything anymore. Oh God, that's still just as good. <laughs> <laughs> it's still just as good. I wish he had one that I didn't really like a lot, but I really can't complain about one of these reds. I was a little hesitant at the Cab Frank, and by mm -hmm. hesitant I mean apprehensive, because I know how temperamental that can be yeah. in regards to what's yeah. wrong, but boy, was that good. Yeah. So. And, and again, just going back to the theme for tonight, these are all varietals that normally you wouldn't have in the bottle by themselves. Normally they'd be blended in, uh, you know, it's going to be like 70% Cabernet Sauvignon and 25% Merlot and then 5% of the Carignan. So it's, it, they're, they're in such small, minute quantities in wines that you normally drink. So it's a real pleasure to be able to taste these tonight. It sure is, and it, especially for me since I can't really get these here, and I have you to thank for bringing them down. Yeah. And uh, I, actually, I wish Attorney Farrell was here to taste these. You know, we had a lot of feedback on the attorney show that we mm -hmm. did last month, and we will have him back on again soon because there's so many other aspects of Connecticut liquor laws and wine and stuff like that we want to carry. But uh, I, I would love to ask him about the labels again because I know he think he said it was like $200 to get a label put yeah. on a bottle. Yeah. But these labels are really beautiful, and I, don't, I know a lot of times labels will sell wine. And uh, these really pop on a show. They do. And that's, you know, we did that show a couple of months ago with the black labels. And, and that's the driving force behind marketing efforts today is to, to create these yeah. labels that can just kind of suck you in and don't tell you a whole lot about the vineyard, don't tell you a whole lot about the family history. Uh, but they, they leave some kind of intrigue. And so, yeah, I think the ink block kind of. Kind of but but don't be right fooled. Out. The label has to match what's in the bottle because people will buy it the first time, and if they don't like it, they're not going to go back. Well, right for for another, right. For another I, bottle. Hopefully, they wouldn't. Well, you know, if, if you buy, you know, if you or I were to buy a bad bottle, we're not going to buy it a second time. But yeah, that's true. Some people. Well, might sometimes actually, I have done that, <laughs> thinking that maybe I tasted it wrong. Well, in our amazing few moments here, Jim, um, what else you got planned up in Boston? Any big tastings coming up? Uh, there's there's always tastings. I'm always inviting you up, and you are constantly it's been a rough shooting summer. me down. So. No, it's been a rough summer for both of us. I know you're busy. You have some construction going on in your home. Uh, it's the middle of the summer. It's yeah. tough now because everybody's going on vacation. Yeah. But uh, actually, it's the longest it's been since we haven't been up to uh, you know, imbibe. You, you've got to come back. <laughs> uh, I just did a, a tasting of Loire Valley wines, and uh, there's some fabulous stuff coming out of the Loire Valley. Uh, I've been a big fan. That was actually the first vineyard I ever toured when I was 18 years old was in the Loire Valley. So I, I was happy to go back and taste my way through 80 different wines. And you're still into the Vino Verdes, I'm, I'm hearing? Uh, yeah, there. a lot of Vino Verdes. Uh, it's a great summertime choice. You know, and Rosé Vino Verdes, right? Yeah, they, they make a Rosé version of Vino Verde. So, um, you know, if you're looking for something light and fun, so that's a great choice. Uh, they're slightly effervescent, so they've got a little bit of a bubble to them. I'm there, buddy. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody for watching. I hope everybody has a great summer and uh, drink safely. And uh, until next time, I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. Keep both of us in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.